Well, I've been on a staycation for about a week. I have my daughter with me today. Alejandra, how was the staycation? Terrible. That's kind of uh, her reaction to most every question I have. She likes to, uh, I don't know where she gets that from, that kind of uh, dark humor. Anyhow, uh, it was nice. I made uh, fresh salsa almost every day, you know, being from Texas and uh, not having a lot of Tex-Mex places to go to in Amsterdam. It's nice to make some salsa. Tastes like home. You know what you got to look for? Uh, I, th- I found when, you're, when I'm making salsa, right? When you buy it in a jar, which is totally fine. It's no judgment about that. But what you'll find is that it's very smooth, right? It's, uh, you know, because it's, I don't know, I guess canned. I guess pickled is different than canned, but it's definitely uh, canned. So I like to make mine uh, very chunky. Leave big uh, tomato chunks in there. I like to cut out some onions, kind of save those small things, and uh, put those in afterwards. Because what I like to do is I have a little blender, and uh, I just blend most of the stuff together, an onion, uh, fresh jalapeno, uh, tomatoes, of course. You got to have that. And uh, all sorts of other uh, thrilling things like that. Anyways, if you want to know my uh, salsa recipe, I'll, I'll, I can send it to you <laughs> if, if you want to email me. But this morning, I was, uh, as, as the, the little topic here at the beginning, I was, I was reading an interview with someone who came out with an Agile book recently. And, uh, you know, it seemed like a good interview. Lots of, as I would say, mindset or mind shift things, like how you think about, uh, uh, you know, building a culture of trust and innovation and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot to be said for that, uh, that Google, what do they call it? Not anatomy. That study that they did that has some kind of Greek name, if I remember, about how, you know, you need to have people feel uh, safe at their organization. Now, as always, when it comes to using whatever, we used to call them the fang or the four or whatever, but when using tech companies as a basis for not so much how what you should do, but as guidance for how to do it, you have to be a little cautious. Because the thing with Google is they make billions of dollars of profit uh, in every quarter on ads. And I'm sure some other things, but when you have that much money just sloshing around, you've got a lot more flexibility if you choose to take it. Now, that's not to say if you're not an organization like that, that you, uh, you can't. It just, you might have different uh, challenges, different things uh, that, that, uh, you need to do to get to that point to transform to where you uh, can start changing your your uh, sort of software side of your house over the product side of your house to run differently so you can get to the point where you've got lots of cash sloshing around anyways always just something to be cur- uh, cautious of but it was making me remember something kind of a principle that i keep in my head when i read about methodology and hopefully when i talk about it which is that in general it's uh in life and in business Doing something often works a lot better than doing nothing. Now, that's a trite little quippy way of putting it. I don't know if it's trite, but it's quippy. Uh, but what, what I mean by that is that oftentimes when you're changing the way the organization is working, be it uh, you know, you're trying to be more agile in your software development, you're introducing product management, or at the managerial and executive level, you know, you're trying to do uh, servant leadership and uh, be more, as I would say, small batch driven, doing experiments and kind of having that product approach to doing software, doing your digital transformation. You often have plans and methods and uh, processes, cultures that you want to put in place, and they seem great. And oftentimes they are. But what I've noticed over the years in these kind of initiatives, especially when I've been involved in them, is that you, I realize how little process or how little deliberate uh, tactics and things were happening before that, which is to say, going back to the quip, doing something works better than doing nothing, that nothing was really happening. There wasn't a, a discipline of following a process. And instead, people just kind of meandered around and did their kind of old reflexive things uh, that they remembered. And I, I remember especially way back when, in uh, <laughs> the early 2000s, I was, I was lucky that I was, I was at uh, BMC Software, a large software company. Uh, I was in their Austin offices. And we were in a group, uh, thanks to an old friend of mine, uh, as in he's been a friend of mine for a while, Israel Gat. He's, great, he's a great, great, uh, fun person to have some lunch with, lots of great ideas. Uh, he's, he's, he's really, I, I miss being able to go uh, talk with him. He would really tolerate my uh, spaciness and all over the place tangential stuff uh, and uh, give me a little bit of his own as well. 
But anyhow, he introduced Scrum to the group. And previous to that, we had been doing one of those kind of evolved rational uh, sorts of things, right? Where we had lots of UML and we had uh, a lot of requirements documents, things like that. Uh, and we sort of followed that, but it had fallen into that category of uh, another sort of quippy thing where the, the process was the product, right? It had kind of fallen into the category where producing a lot of these diagrams and uh, requirements docs, this is a little unfair uh, characterization, but we had kind of not been constantly gardening and thinking about if this was the best way to do things or the best way to spend our time. Um, but, you know, that's kind of a, a not great example. But at the time, I remember us switching over to Scrum. And not only did it give us a very specific, if simple, framework of things to do, right? Daily stand-ups, up, stand which, of course, we did sitting down. We had the, uh, the, the sit-down stand-up, which was fine. It was not a big deal. We had the the retrospectives, the uh, doing stories on a on I forget if it was weekly or twice weekly, but we did all the stuff, and um, I think it worked out well. <laughs> there was there was a good case study that that uh, Israel uh, put together with some other people, and he uh, he kind of helped people understand what was going on there. And there was another guy, Walter Bodwell. It really kind of spread out a lot of uh, interesting uh, sort of improvement uh, at the time in the the little community there. But, you know, what I noticed is that following that disciplined way of doing stuff, very, very specific stuff, one, I think it gave the team, it gave people a boost in morale in that even if they kind of disagreed with it, we had a process. We had the safety of, of a framework to follow, of knowing what to do. And uh, there was really very little ambiguity about it. And of course, you could make fun of things. I mean, programmers are always going to make fun of things and try to be uh, unmaskers and talk about the the falseness of something but i think one that's just sort of like uh the mentality of of a lot of the people who are in there but you know you also have this engineering mindset we're always looking for you could say the flaws in the system but also the uh opportunities for introducing quality here you want to you want to get on camera a little bit more oh you can see beyond my studio walls what do you do you want Oh, she's made a uh, she's made an ice cream. Let's see, let's move this over there. Yeah, is that what we, we're going to be having uh, later today? Yeah. All right. Now back to your regularly scheduled program. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Their school schedule is a little wacky sometimes. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's fun, but they uh, they had last week off, and then for some reason, uh, and again, for some great reason, they have uh, Monday and Tuesday off. Um, you know, here in Europe, people really, especially in Northern Europe, people really value taking vacations to go to warmer places. And, and I think these school schedules are quite accommodating of that, right? It, it, uh, you can go away for a week and come back on a Sunday and then you got like a day or two to kind of get back in the swing of things. Anyhow, I think the team, while they were skeptical as, as programmers will be in engineering types, I think it was nice because you had this process to follow that was explicit and that you were also kind of helping evolve. And it's also like, you know, interesting and fun to try something new. We all got Scrum certified. I'm sure mine is way out of date, but it was, uh, you know, enjoyable to uh, figure that out. So in that instance, I think a lot of the improvements that we started to see, improvements in kind of the dependability of the process and having something to follow in the morale was just because we'd kind of like let our old process kind of lay fallow and uh, we hadn't really evolved it. And we'd kind of just, you know, gone through as sort of like a zombie process. And I think what I've noticed uh, since then in various types of work is that when you try to, when you introduce uh, a disciplined way of doing things, right, you have that same effect where it's often sort of revealed that there was no process followed very well in the first place and you hadn't been take, taking care of it. So I think that points to a tactic and maybe a safety, uh, a good feeling you can have about introducing a new process, which is don't assume that the process you're following needs to be defended or not that it's not good, but that like it's, well, that it's good <laughs> or that you even have a process in the first place, right? So oftentimes transforming isn't so much transforming from one thing to another, but bringing on a new process. So I think that is a little more heartening than 
taking that risky leap of going from the way we currently do things to this new way of doing things. Because really, what you're doing is you're going to a way of doing things. And that should be less risky than doing things uh, in no way, having nothing to do. So, and I think you'll you also find is that as you're adapting and learning how to apply that new process, uh, it gives you a chance to, you know, custom fit the way you're going to be operating your culture, your tactics uh, to how things actually are operating now. Because really, if you're doing like, you know, big upfront design and um, not design, but big upfront requirements and all these things, like it's probably not that great and, and well suited to uh, how you want to go about doing things. And I would not, I'm repeating myself here a bit, but I would not focus so much on how do we preserve the good parts of what we're doing? Uh, what's the risk in adapt, uh, going to this new system? Because chances are you're not following mo much of a system and anything's going to be better uh, than, than what you're currently doing. Now, you can also interpret that to mean that like, it doesn't matter what you switch to. You could switch to anything, which there's probably uh, some positive uh, truth to that as well. But uh, I think the important part is to constantly, to avoid that trap that we were in and not really go into a zombie process of doing things. Now, kind of related to this is something when I started working uh, further away from code, uh, kind of in the white collar world, I would notice that people from an engineering perspective, or let's, you know, programmer, whatever you think, engineer is a fun word, but you know, we're just, they're just programmers engineers all of the thing. Um, but from a, a programmer perspective, where you do try to follow some sort of rigorous process, you, you know, value documentation, you kind of come up with ways to communicate and collaborate and decide what to do. When I went more and more into white collar work, and especially, you know, management meetings and meetings for meetings and all that stuff. At first, I found it really shocking that there were very little tools in use, right? There's Oftentimes, not version control. Oftentimes, people just use whatever collaboration stuff they have available, right? And they try to kind of make sense of it. And you see this a lot with things like, uh, you know, your sales, like things like Salesforce and CRM systems, where they're, you know, they're very inconsistently followed. And I often wonder, like, if organizations have training on them and they kind of, uh, if they're really coordinating and optimizing the tools uh, they get used. There's one, you know, the opposite of that. We have, uh, we have uh, the head of our sales engineers. Over the years, uh, they've come up with a very, in a good way, ornate, a very detailed way of like keeping track of what happens in, in sales meetings uh, and kind of post-sales integration meetings. And uh, they have these little percent signs. They're kind of like tags. And you'll tag those, uh, these various things, like what the topic of the meeting was, the, uh, where it is, and kind of like the... Um, what would you call it, the, the maturity of the customer relationship. And then they run reports that show up in Tableau that really do kind of, uh, they're pretty astonishing. You get a, a snapshot of what's happening there. But that level of tool use, of reporting, of consistency and process and tools followed, I very rarely found in the, uh, the kind of white collar managerial organizations and projects I worked in. At best, uh, every, every annually, the, the the centralized planning finance people would send you um, <laughs> they would send you PowerPoint templates uh, that you needed to fill out. But there wasn't really I don't know. It was always really weird. So I would do that. You know, think about your non coding uh, kind of work and think about what tools do we use, what processes do we follow. Are we always thinking about the tool that we're going about doing things and evolving it? And I think the the prototypical to go back to the fangs or the fours or the whoever's is you've got your Amazon six page memo, right? Which, uh, and there's also the process of writing a press release around that. Um, every now and then when I run into an Amazon person, I ask them to verify the six page memo thing that it actually happens. And it seems to happen. It seems legit. But that itself, if you think about it, is a tool, right? Is a process uh, that people follow. Uh, and it's very, uh, I use the word disciplined incorrectly. It's very specific in, in what you need to do down to how many pages it is and the first 15 minutes of the meeting you read things and stuff like that. So, you know, in the same way that standardizing on something like the wonderful VMware Tanzu stack as your architecture and runtime environment can remove a lot of variability and duplication from your stack. I would think about, you know, in your managerial meetings and your kind of white collar uh, meetings, 
also standardizing on some some stack, some tool chain, some process that you follow, follow and uh, evolving that as well. And I think what you'll find equally is that doing something is doing is much better than the nothing you were doing previously. All right, well, let me switch over to uh, a couple of tiny things uh, I, I wanted to highlight. And I'll put these in the show notes, which you can get. One day, I'll get a more official, better URL. But at the moment, you can go to kote.io slash Tanzu Talk if you want to see. You can go there. You can see the most recent uh, thing going on. Uh, and then you can also come and check out links to the shows that we have, right? This one was uh, has been very popular, which is nice. It's uh, Look at that. I make these funny pictures. But, you know, you can see Mark and I talking about uh, modernization. It looks like I have not updated to uh, the most recent one. I don't know. We'll see what's going on there. Anyhow, uh, but you, you can go, these links I'm going to talk about, you can go to kote.io slash Tanzu talk to see. But I'll just highlight them briefly, and then we can wrap up with a short one for today. And uh, I think all of these are actually uh, from VMware stuff. But I should say Tanzu. But this is, there's a good article here on, uh, you know, you might hear people talking about edge computing, uh, which is, I think, as someone famous in the Kubernetes world joked, is just another way of saying on-premise or private cloud, which is sort of true. Uh, a lot of it is more, I think, as defined here, this is a pretty good, good piece to look over if you want to know, uh, kind of get a definition of what edge is and things like that. But it's basically, uh, and this is where Robo comes in, it's basically, if you think about a lot of businesses that have physical locations, stores, banks, uh, also, you know, places that give out loans that have like little offices everywhere, larger restaurants. But there's sure, there's also industrial things. I think we often think about edge as only IoT and being in factories and stuff like that, which is not incredibly accurate. Oh, oh, this is terrible. Let me adjust uh my screen thing here you know very very embarrassing let me in fact i think do i have i had the ipad one one head and a screen two heads big zoom i was you know for mark i was fiddling around with stuff but so you're gonna have to put up with uh with a bad way let me cycle through that that was okay that one's not don't like that Okay, we're going to come back to this one. And I'm just going to give you a, uh, a rough version of this done in real time. I'm going to cover the logo. Ah! Anyhow, this piece is nice because it defines uh, what some of the requirements that you have when you're operating. Again, I, I think for most people thinking about a store, right, where you've got, whether it's a big box store or small box store, uh, where you have centralized management of your sort of IT estate, and then you might be running a, uh, a Kubernetes or even more cluster that handles, uh, as it goes over, you know, doing um, uh, stuff in the store like inventory runs or just running cash registers, stuff like that. And I think there's, is it four? There's some good, prim, uh, some good uh, sort of requirements and ways of thinking through it, all of which you can tell by my rambling through summarizing it. I have not memorized, but it's nice. It, it gives you a, a good overview of what goes on there. And there's also a, a white paper, which I have not put, uh, if you follow my other podcast software to find talk, you know that I have a good friend, Johnny Legion, who I always ask to download papers for me, uh, but I'll have to go check that out. So there is, uh, there's that. I'd recommend that you look at that. And then the next one, so after Spring One Platform, uh, several of my coworkers have been going in and uh, summarizing talks that are there. And this is, this is one highlight from a, uh, a T-Mobile talk. Uh, you know, they, they, they're a longtime customer of ours and Let's see if we can look at the exact figures. They're running uh, Kubernetes, the Tanzu Kubernetes, and they have like 100,000 containers. And uh, AIs are what, uh, in the Cloud Foundry world, uh, it's like a process, basically. But you can see they've got a large install there. And they said one thing that I thought, I thought was a, a clever way of thinking about things, right? And again, in my mind, a lot of what you're getting from a, I don't know, enterprise architecture way is when you do something, whether it's the Tanzu application service, uh, you know, a platform as a service or uh, lower down in the stack, a uh, Tanzu Kubernetes grid, like, a, you know, a Kubernetes cluster thing. A lot of the benefit that you're getting is standardizing on something, removing variability, 
uh, from your process. And we, you know, when you remove variability, that makes things more efficient because you have one thing to, to, to manage, one way of managing it. It makes training and skills easier because you have one thing to manage, right? You have one skill set, especially if it's a standard, even though it's hard to find, uh, you know, people nowadays who, who know those stacks uh, and in general cloud native things. Over time, as, as they standardize, it'll be a more and more common skill uh, to have, which, you know, you saw with like Puppet and Chef and uh, Salt and Ansible and all those things uh, in the past. And then also, um, it does also help you protect you from uh, future technical debt, right? Instead of having all these various different stacks and ways of doing things, which will atrophy, become zombies in their own right, you've got the, the one thing to worry about, the one way of doing things. Now, nothing is ever so perfect as that, but, you know, it's more perfect than other perfects, to borrow from Animal Farm, I guess. But the one thing that I thought was fun about them is they, they have taken this uh, to kind of a logical conclusion. And this is also kind of what you have with, uh, with if you're using public cloud, right, is that everything is the production server, right? Like production looks the same if it's whether it's, you know, not production development or whatever or production and then also the urgency of fixing things, I take it, is is the same, right? So again, they're reducing what's being managed, right? They have one thing that they manage. Now, it might be spread out in different like clouds or infrastructure, but they have one mentality of how they do things. And it also, I imagine, forces uh, them, and if you follow this, to have the same uh, quality service in all instances, which means, you know, you prioritize removing waste and wait time and you know all this kind of stuff, even if it's in the development world. And you're constantly with kind of a, a SRE mentality trying to remove toil and improve things, even for uh, you know lower priority things uh, like like developer stuff. So you know there's more summary in there. These are these are pretty good summaries uh, as it goes. So then finally, uh, I think this is only a little bit from from our stuff, but uh, let's see where where is this from. I don't run. Oh yeah. So, you know, it's one of, it's, it's, uh, like I mentioned, I use this thing called nuzzle, which summarizes, uh, links that people in Twitter, uh, put now I don't actually follow anyone in Twitter. Uh, I don't know why I use lists instead. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. And so I'll, I'll go to a list and there's one, one in nuzzle that you can have that, uh, James Waters always is cataloging interesting things about, people documenting what they're doing in the cloud native and Kubernetes world. And there's one from Cockroach DB where they're talking about uh, how they're using Kubernetes to run their database as a service. And they hit upon, you know, a common theme for me, right? That by using Kubernetes, they have a common interface, right? Or architecture, I would say, which, you know, I think, again, it's, it's something that I talk about uh, a little too much, but I think what that means, as I was just saying, is you, des you def decide on this enterprise architecture and that becomes, I wouldn't say, well, there is a programming model implied in it, but it's, it's, you've decided on the architecture you follow. Just like uh, J2EE or JE, as it was known, is a, an architecture that you decide on, which has a programming model behind it, or if you're doing things in whatever style. But I generally think that with very few exceptions, you should find some external architecture that's been defined by someone or some something else some entity and an external programming model rather than coming up with and maintaining your own right it's generally better just to use uh stuff that came from somewhere else <laughs> uh, especially if you find a community that that you can trust and looks to be thriving and uh and lively which is a good thing to always check into but then there was an example i forget it where it was from but the uh the register wrote up uh this this piece uh, oh no! Wait, sorry. Let me go back. This this piece about how I think it's on the uh, the the U two spy planes. Something I didn't know st still existed, but I guess they do. That they're uh, deploying Kubernetes on there to run the how many was it? There's a couple of uh, clusters on there or a couple of computers. I I forget. But um, you know, that's that's fun in the novelty of it. But there's a there's a reference here that kind of explains that, right? Like, and and it's the uh, who wrote this story, so I can it's the Killian guy, if I remember. Oh no, Gareth Corfield. That's a fun name, Corfield. Um, anyways, you can see that he kind of synthesizes what's going on here. That you've got you can run multiple software packages, so multiple workloads, multiple things that are fit to that architecture, right? 
So instead of the applications that you might be running and in, in military and larger things like this, there's a lot of um, all the way down to the metal, including the metal customized stacks that exist instead of having uh, general purpose reusable things. Now, I mean, there's both, but it, it comes up very frequently, which it probably does in the private sector too. But you can see an example of that Kubernetes as architecture in play where there's this architecture being put in place and it means it can support multiple workloads or software packages. It's a, a standard that you have uh, in place there. So I think there's, there's a lot further more to think about when it comes to uh, what does it mean to use Kubernetes as your architecture and have that trickle down to your programming model and therefore get the benefits of, benefits of standardizing um, and centralizing what you're doing, which are not only for your present day uh, uh, sort of standardization and benefits, but have those other two effects that I think are really vital, which is it becomes easier to hire people and even retain them to train them up. Um, and I guess also you get, you know, new innovations as things are updated. You don't have to innovate it yourself. But I think the longer term strategy is that as long as it's a thriving, evolving community along the, around for that standard or stack, which appears to be the case with Kubernetes and certainly has been the case with uh, things like Tan with Tanzu application uh, server, that you are helping hedge against the negatives of tech debt in the future, right? You're, you're, you're making sure you're not building up a stack that people don't understand, that they don't know about, that's uh, annoying and risky uh, to, to operate and own. And uh, that's really, I mean, all the organizations I talk with, they are, tech debt is really harming them. And it's something that, like most people with debt, they don't really plan around that and they don't prioritize worrying about it. So anytime, anytime you can uh, focus on, get something that helps you with tech debt, that's always uh, better. Well, just as a few little show notes. So uh, tomorrow, uh, Rita and I, uh, of the usual uh, Tanzu Talk podcast, we're going to have a, a little live to tape recording, which is to say we're not broadcasting it live with Mark Ardito, Ar Ardito who uh, he's, he's, He's been in the uh, the kind of pivotal Tanzu realm for a while at various organizations. I remember going up to uh, the office of one place he was working up in Chicago, and uh, it was nice. I got to give like a 90-minute a talk, so I got to ramble on to a big room of people who I think they all stayed there, listened, and had questions afterwards. It was, it was kind of my uh, what is culture and what are tactics for transforming organizations. Um, and I think the the topic that we're thinking about going over is sort of does does how do you think about the the payoff for doing things in a cloud way how do you plan for it measure it make sure that it's uh, actually working out well for you uh which is a big vague topic but it should uh, it should be nice and then of course if you want to see all the shows we do here on Tanzu Talk uh if you go to the schedule is not really that great uh, how how uh, Twitch sets it up for you it kind of just tells you the category which is odd um but you can see we've got all sorts of things. You know, most people do it in uh, in America here. So it's if you're here in Europe, it's later in the day. But you can always go to uh, tanzu.tv and uh, find the recordings of them, which I would encourage you, of course, to do. Well, just to wrap up, here's your three calls to action if you're interested. Now, if you're interested in figuring out more about Kubernetes, getting the benefits of it, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, skills are not abundant as surveys show, but we have a lot of great free courses, very self-guided courses done by experts and people uh, in the Kubernetes world. You can just go to Kube Academy and uh, sign up for that and start learning your Kubernetes stuff, which is very nice. Also, we're collecting together all of our developer-related stuff over at tanzu.vmware.com slash developer. I think we're still working on a better URL for it. Uh, we were looking around for like, you know, tanzu.dev, which I think might be taken already. But, uh, you know, maybe we'll we'll get something there. And then I'll, you can always uh, ask to have a uh, workshop with us, kind of start thinking about what the lay of the land is in your organization and how to prioritize from a very business standpoint, but also kind of a, a tech, tech, technology viability standpoint, what to do, like what's important for your organization, what your your transformation should look like based on not so much what would be interesting and, and technolo technologically fun, but actually valuable to the, uh, the organization that you have. And you can still get both of my books totally for free 
uh, if you want to download them. You can find all that stuff if you go to uh, kote.pizza. You can find the workshop link there uh, to request a workshop and uh, all that stuff as well. All right. Well, as always, during the weekday, I uh, unless I don't, and I do it at some other time, I uh, broadcast daily at 11 a.m. Amsterdam time, Central European time. And we'll see everyone uh, tomorrow. Bye-bye.